Okay, this is the Canvas in the Classroom. Uh, we do have the short link down here that you can use if you've got a smartphone with a QR code reader. You can just point at this and it will bring it up on your smart device. You will have access to this forever and ever, amen. So you can go back and look at it whenever you need to. You will need to be logged into your Canvas course if you have it. If you don't have it, that's cool. You can just sit there today and don't worry about it. But what we're going to do is just simply go through some of the basics of Canvas. Now, this is my information, and I am the system administrator and lead tech support. That is my email address uh, and my Twitter account. You may want to take the Twitter accounts down, the Craig Jackson Twitter account. I'm just going to be using that to tweet out information as it comes up about here's some interesting articles you may want to read about online learning, here's some interesting tools you may want to try to, to get and use, things like that. Strictly business, nothing personal is on there. The second one is the at RCU Tech. This one will let you know if we are having system problems. I will post up today the system is slow. Uh, at, it's 9-11, the system is slow. And when it gets back up to normal speed, I'll put that up. That way you can know if there's a problem. We've got our blog down here. This is a secondary blog that we can do that has just information that I put up about uh, technology, e-learning, and different things. We do have a blog for MDE Canvas, and I will show you that one later. Now, you can put questions up, if you'd like, in the question box, as Mr. Buckholz was doing earlier. If you'd like to do that, you can do that, and I can catch those as we go. If we get going too fast, let me know. If we're going too slow, let me know. And if we're not going at all, well, let me sleep. <coughs> now, Four things we're really going to focus on today. Terminology, user interface, content types, and course management. Those four items, that's what Canvas boils down to. And if you don't use the right terminology, you're going to be in the wrong user interface, and it's going to affect your content type, and definitely going to affect your course management. There are some changes for the six of you who have worked with Canvas. There are changes that have been made to the user interface and the way things work this year. Nothing major. Nothing to get mad about and hit Mr. Buckholz about. He didn't have anything to do with it. But there are some changes. Let's go ahead and get started with terminology. These are the five things that you're really going to need to know. And I need to change this last one. I will do that one after the session. Activities versus assignments. Graded versus non-graded assignments. Navigation menu versus navigation menu, settings versus settings, and the draft state. And the draft state is going to be published versus unpublished published, because they've changed that to the, to the draft state. Assignments and activities. Activities are things that you do daily. When, you, when your students come in, you give them a bell ring or a uh, bell ringer work, you tell them to watch a, a video, look at a PowerPoint, read a PDF. That's an activity. Activities are not graded. Therefore, they do not appear in the grade book. Of the three who used Canvas last year, you probably had a grade book with a ton of stuff in there because you put a bell ringer as an, as a, an assignment. Because you're used to saying, okay, students, your assignment today is, well, you're assigning them an activity. Assignments are not always on a daily basis. They are quizzes and discussions and surveys. Let me pull up real quick a, let's see, assignments versus activities. This is something that Canvas put out last year, and I found very, very helpful. The difference between an assignment and an activity. I'll give you just a second to take a look at that, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit just so you can see some of the what, what each one of them does. I will make this available to you if you would like this. As you can see, any assignment is auto-linked and automatically created in the grade book unless it is non-graded. Okay? 
If it is non-graded, you have to put that one in if you want to. I don't recommend it. But these are your assignment types right here. Graded discussions, quizzes. We don't do attendance, so you don't have to worry about that. All of these other things, the wiki pages, downloading a file, if you've got a practice quiz, a discussion, and announcements, those do not go in the gradebook. If you've got five assignments per day, and you've got 180 days of class, and you do five assignments every single day, that's a lot of grades in the gradebook. You know what's going to happen then? I'm going to get a call saying, how come I've got so many grades in the gradebook? That's why. Because every time you do it as an assignment, it's going to go in the gradebook. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the question we have about the reason we have all these as assignments, I want to make sure that my students go through and do the material, and if I don't make it graded, they won't do it. That's a good argument. But it's not a valid argument. There are ways to give out activities and then to ensure that the students have read the material. You can go in and put a discussion question. You can even make it a graded discussion. So you got it maybe once a week. And they have to get the information for that discussion question from the activities that they were supposed to have done. OK, we'll get into that a little bit later on as we get into the, the course management. Again, you can see that uh, assignments can be evaluated with rubrics or aligned to outcomes. Activities cannot. And then there's just a, a quick video, I mean, a, a picture here. And this is just kind of slow because it's larger than normal, so you can see it. But there's the different types of submissions that you can have, file upload, URL, text entry, whatever. The assignments are locked until a certain thing. Activities cannot be locked, per se. Assignments are still going to be based on whatever score you put in. Quizzes, however, are going to be on one point value unless you go in and change each individual question. And we'll discuss that a little bit later as well. Any questions on activities versus assignments? Then I'll stop and drink some coffee now while you type or ask some questions. Please ask questions at any point during this. This is for you. Okay, no questions. So if I come back and give you a quiz on assignments versus activities later, you can answer that correctly. I'm going to hold you to that, Rex. Make sure you know the difference. Graded versus non-graded assignments. And again, if you've used this before, you know that you've got the option on any type of assignment to make it graded or non-graded, whether it's a quiz, whether it's a discussion, a survey, or whatnot. They can be graded or non-graded. Graded assignments appear in the gradebook. Non-graded assignments do not appear in the gradebook. Now that's important because you're going to wonder why something's not showing up in the gradebook. It's probably because it's non-graded. If it does show up in the gradebook, but you don't want it to, it's because you made a graded assignment, whether it's homework, a quiz, or a discussion. Any need to go in and look at that at this point? Oh, the quickest learners I've ever had. No questions. I like this. It'll be a short day for me. OK. Nav menu versus nav menu. That's navigation menu versus navigation menu. If you have looked at your interface, the user interface, you'll notice you've got a global navigation menu across the top of the page. We'll go look at this in just a minute. It has buttons for courses, assignments, grades, and calendars. Now you're going to be anxious just to go in there and just jump in one of these things to do assignments or look at your grades, and that's fine, except for the fact that it's going to show you 
everything from every course you are enrolled in as a teacher or as a student. The global navigation menu is not meant to be used once you are in your course. It is to be used in the dashboard so you can look ahead and see just an overview of what you've got going. The course navigation menu is going to be on the left-hand side of your interface. That navigation menu is just for whichever specific class you have chosen. If you've got five classes and you choose to look at the first one, that's all that's going to show up in that menu. Let's take a look. I know you're all waiting for that. I am. When we come in and look at, first of all, let's go to the dashboard. When you first log in, you'll see your global navigation menu right up here. Courses, assignments, grades, and calendar. Okay? Again, I go here and I can choose the specific course that I want to get into. If I click on assignments, this is going to show me assignments in all of my courses. If you're teaching two or three different classes, ICT1, ICT2, maybe something else, you're going to have all the assignments due in each one of those courses that you teach or anything you're in as a student. So you're going to have to be going up and down and looking at this stuff and you're going to say, you know, I really don't like this guy. So remember, this shows you an overview of everything. Same thing with the grades. When you click on the grades in the global navigation menu, it's going to show you the courses that you're taking and the courses that you're teaching. But what you've got to do to get in and look at what these five students are doing, you've got to click in here. So it's just a quick way to look and see what you've got. Okay? The calendar allows you to come in and look at what you've got scheduled for whichever course you are teaching or taking. You can go by the month or you can go by the week and look at it. If I had stuff and all these courses are already completed so there's not going to be anything in here. But everything, as you can see how many courses I've got, now I'm going to have an awful lot of stuff to look at. So it's going to be crazy. Don't expect to go in here and just see what you're doing in a singular specific class. Okay? Any questions about the global navigation menu? I know somebody's got to have a question somewhere. Okay, let's continue on then. We've got the global navigation menu, and as I mentioned, when you go to your course, your specific course, now you've got a global navigation menu at the top. You've got your course navigation menu on the left-hand side. Is there a different sections, are there different sections for each course? You have to go into the course to see that. We'll go into that in just a little bit, but that's a good question. That's also a way you can do block courses. If you've got courses on the block schedule, we've got a way where you can do that this year. Here's the reason we're talking about the difference in the, the terminology. Say you're having problems. Say, I, I'm having problems with assignments. Okay, what's wrong with the assignments? Well, it doesn't show me what I want to see. Well, you'll notice you've got assignments in the course nav in the global navigation. You've got assignments in the course navigation menu. Which one of these assignments are you having problems seeing things in? You need to be sure when you, you know the difference in these two. Same thing with grades. Grades here shows you your grade book just for that particular course. Not for everybody. Just that one particular course versus coming up here and clicking on something and saying, well, you've got 14 students. Now I've got to go in here anyway. So you need to make sure that when you're doing one of these things, you talk about it in the right 
in the right way. Course navigation menu, global navigation menu. You've got assignments, which will take the assignments from here, shows everything. This one just shows you the assignments in your particular course. As we click on that, you'll see now I've got my assignments right here. We've done the same thing with grades. So these buttons right here do the same as these buttons here, except they only show the assignments and the grades for that particular course. Any of you group of five who have not really done a lot with Canvas, any questions through this? I know the six of you who have already done this. I know Candy Pierce has done some teaching on this and, and tried to help people out. Any of you others have any questions? Okay, the question is, are they broken down into specific classes? Would that be the grades or the assignments? In the course navigation menu, right here, assignments and grades are broken down for this specific course right here. If I went up here and go to um, social media, You'll notice now that my, my heading up here is online social media. If I go to grades here, it shows me the grades in that particular course right here. If I go to assignments, it's going to show me the assignments in this course right here and this course only. Okay, the question is, if you teach the same course to three different classes, can each section, can you have a section for each one? Okay, let me clarify that. You're asking if the teacher has six different periods, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth period, that she teaches, he teaches ICT 1 to. Is that correct? Okay, if you have one course, which is your ICT-1, and you have six class periods, you can and will want to break that down into sections so that each class period is by itself. Now, when you do that, you are not going to have different content. Your students are going to see the same content as the other sections would see. You can, however, on your quizzes and assignments and discussions, you can have different opening and closing dates for each section. So if, if first period you want them to see it on Monday, if you want the second period to see it on Tuesday and third period to see it on Wednesday and so forth, what you would do is you would open it up to Section 1. It would be available from August 4th until the, the 5th. Section 2 would be available from August 5th until the 6th, and so forth. We'll get into that in, in, in the course management. Is that, does that answer your question? You will also use block. You will use the sections if you're doing block scheduling. If you've got somebody doing the course in the fall and somebody doing it in the spring, and you may just have it at the same time where everybody, you've got one class that's just doing it all year, you can do that with the same course shell by simply creating a, a block section, a block section for, for the fall, a block section for the spring, and have it open on certain dates. That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. But that's, that's where you are. You've got your different, whatever is in here, in your course navigation menu, is what's going to be in this particular class right here. Anything you choose up here, if I go to assignments up here, now I've got to go through and sort through which particular course it's in. 
See, there's online for creating social media. There's online for creating social media. So you're going to have to be going up and down all over the place just to try to find it if you go to the global navigation menu. Same thing with grades. Okay? Ready to move on? All right. Now, the next item is the settings. You've got two different ones. You've got personal settings, which is where you can do your, your email, your text messaging capabilities, uh, course notifications, change your email, change your password, things like that. And then you've got your course settings where you can do your course management, your, your setting of your course dates, your section dates, importing and exporting the content, and some other tools. Okay, and again, that's going to be critical because if you sit there and tell me you're having problems with your settings, I'm going to ask you which one. When you come up here to the, we'll go back to the beginning, the dashboard, first of all, you're going to see your, your global navigation menu, all of your content here, and you've got a settings button up here. This is called the help corner. Very original title that, that, that Canvas decided to give that because you get help here. So what we're going to do is if we go into our particular course, you're going to see once again the global navigation, the course navigation, uh-oh, here's settings over here and here's settings up here. So when you say, hey, Craig, I'm having problems with my settings. Okay, what's wrong? Well, I can't, I can't, change, my, I can't change my name or my password. Well, if you're down here, you're not going to be able to. In the help corner, this is where you do your personal settings. Now, we have limited at this time some of what you can do here, mainly because we don't want students to be able to come in and make some changes. Once you go to settings, this is your email address area. The email that has the star by it is your default email address. That is where you are going to get your email. When we signed you up, it is based on the email address that you put in that sign-in sheet, that, that, that spreadsheet. If that goes to your school and your school email account is closed between May and August, you're not going to get any notifications. That's where you may want to put a secondary email address in. To do that, you just go to your add contact method and you can put another email address in. If you'd like to put a text messaging, a phone number in where you can get text messages, you can do that. We're going to get into that in just a minute. To edit these settings over here, you simply click on the edit settings. You can change your default email, your time zone, your language, and the password. Now, I just heard somebody say, hey, this is great because we've got a lot of, of students that, that speak Spanish, and we really would like to have them do this. This does not do what you think it will. If you go to Spanish and you update your settings, it is going to change the tabs right here and anything that Canvas created. However, anything that you, any course content that you create, unless you create it in Spanish, it's still going to be in English. The only thing that's going to change are the buttons over here and anything that Canvas creates. Now, you're probably saying, why did he choose Spanish? Well, because I know what Espanol means and it's easy to go back to English. I could have done the Australian or the United Kingdom, but my luck, they would have said top of the morning to your governor and I would not have understood what they were talking about. It's that English problem, you know that. Okay, so now we, we know where we're going to change our information here. The reason we don't allow names to be changed, kids have a problem with wanting to put these funky little letters in here, stars and asterisks and all this stuff, uppercase, lowercase, all over the place, and it just wreaks havoc with the system. Okay? I don't like that. Nobody likes that. So we've cut that off for right now. We're looking at ways to, to change that, but we've got to work with instruction to get that done. Now, 
We mentioned earlier about notifications under the settings. By default, the Canvas notifications are set to ASAP. Now, I'm going to take a minute and just let you kind of look over this, and I will see if I can get it where you can see everything at once. What notifications does is Canvas has done away with an emailing system per se. You no longer send out a bulk email to your users. You use the inbox and send in a communication there. That conversation then acts the way this notification preference tells it to. Course activities, discussions, conversations, scheduling, groups, and alerts. If you want to know, every time you get an administrative notification, and that's a course enrollment or a report or anything like that, you can choose between ASAP, which will send you a message immediately to whichever notification system you're using. A daily summary, which comes out between 6 and 8 p.m. every evening. A weekly summary, which comes out between 10 a.m. or 8 a.m. and noon on Saturday. Or don't send me anything. You choose how you want you choose how you want it delivered to you. Now keep in mind, when we have things like a cell phone number to get a text message, or a Twitter account, or a Facebook account, they don't have, Canvas does not have the phone number. You do not have their phone number. Students, if they are trying to send you something and you have it set to come to your email, or your cell number, or your Twitter account, they don't get your number either. This comes, Twitter comes, Facebook comes as a private message. So it doesn't go up on your timeline, it doesn't go up on your wall. Nobody else can see it except you. What we recommend, what I recommend, and this is Craig Jackson, leave the course activities on a daily basis. Your grading policies, course content on a daily basis. ASAP, you want to get your announcements ASAP. So if you post something up, it automatically comes to your email or your text message or your Twitter account instantly. The announcements are not just the ones that you make, but also if you get something in one of the PACE sites that you're in. You will get that immediately versus waiting until the end of the day or the end of the week. That could be because they have something that they need you to get together for a meeting this afternoon and is urgent. And again, you don't have to have it on all these things. You can have it come to your email, ASAP, your your primary, possibly your, your secondary, you don't even want it to come to, unless it's during the summer break when your, your school stuff does not work. Then you've got the cell number. Again, the text account comes to you. Grading, um, I let people send me information that way. Invitations, I'd like to get that ASAP as well because you may get an invitation to a PACE course or if you're taking online uh, VIP or COOL or something through the RCU. The submissions, the late grading, submission comment, you know, I like to have my submission comment come back ASAP because if I'm grading something and somebody has a question about it, it comes to me right then instead of having to wait till the end of the evening or the next day. I like to have my conversations ASAP because that's when you get a message from somebody through the inbox. That is your email, and it will come to your email address. If you allow students to sign up for appointments or they cancel appointments, yeah, go ahead and do that every day. I mean, do that ASAP. That's just me because if, if somebody needs to get into it, you get to know that right away. Okay. All these are very simple on the cell number. If I want to get something on, on um, all submissions, I simply click that, and now it's there. If I want to get it on Twitter, I do that, and now it's there. It is that simple to get that as quickly as I want it. And I like to have that because sometimes it is easier 
and quicker to get a text message on something that's important rather than watching your email for that. And if your email is like mine, you get a ton of junk mail in there. Unless you set up a rule that, that lets you know you've got something from Canvas, you're going to be trying to find it in a bunch of junk mail. Craig, can okay, you hear I, us back? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we just had to do a little rigging. That's okay. All right. What, do I have to start all over again now? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Y'all been sleeping through this whole thing saying, ha-ha, he thinks he can hear us. That's right. Do you have any questions on what we've talked about so far? Anybody got any questions? He can hear you now. Yeah. All right, we're good. Okay. So we know about the settings up here in the help corner. Let's go back now and look at the settings in the course navigation menu. This is where you are going to do your course management, your course details. This is your course name and your course code and your SIS ID. You'll notice up here, those uh, six users, the three users from last year, you see now where it says course is published in green. That wasn't there last year, was it? Candy, was that there last year? Yes, yes sir, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I, I was asking her a question, so I had to detain. Mr. Buckholz, oh, okay, okay. what was your question? That's okay. In the course details last yes. year, do you remember seeing this course is published and little cloud icon? Uh, I don't think so. Should I? That's good. You paid okay. attention. <laughs> That's one of the new features in Canvas this year. Okay, great. When you come to the course details, what you can do is you can change a couple of things here. The first thing is the starting and the end date of a particular course. We are finally getting our terms set up, and we are opening courses on July 15th and closing them on June 15th each year. Okay. Now, as a teacher, you may say, but I'm not starting to use my class till September the 1st, so I don't really want it open that long. And I get out of here on May 30th, so I don't want my kids to have access to it to the 15th. What you can do is simply click on the start date right here. And when you do, and you'll notice, what you'll notice, I meant to tell you this at the top of the story. I am using my teacher account. I am not using a system administrator account. This is a teacher account. This is exactly what you will see when you go to your course and to settings and to course details. You can change the time zone. I know some of you got a warped sense of humor, and you might want to put it at Midway Island. That's fine. You can do that. Probably central time is best. If you want to set your course start and end time to a different date, you simply come over here to starts and find what you want to start it on. And if you want to say September 1st, you change it to that. If you want to end it on May 30th, of 2015 or May 29th, you do that. Your dates right here have now just overridden our system term dates. Okay? So that means that you are scheduling your course to start and end when you want it. Make sure you click this button down here that users can only participate during these dates. Okay? Any questions on that? You cannot change the term. You cannot change the department. But right here, if you want to let your course go and be available to students until December of the next year, you can do that. All right? Now I'm going to cancel those dates. Now, a couple of other things you can do on your, your edit. Go down to More Options. This is kind of important. I don't like to let students attach files to discussions. They could be putting something up there that has a virus. I don't want that to happen. Th 
this is a professional learning class, so I let my students create discussion topics. You may not want to because they may start a discussion on why they don't like uh, Ms. Gore or why they don't like Mr. Herring, and it's up there. And if the kids know it's up there at night and you don't, they could all sit there and have a field day and then clear it out. So normally, I don't let students create discussion topics. Letting them edit or delete their discussion post, that's going to be your personal opinion, just like the, like the students up here. I don't want them, I let them delete it or edit it. Again, I'm dealing with instructors, and so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not going to sit there and, and do silly things. I let my students organize their own groups. You may not want to do that. If you let students organize their own groups, now they can get in that group and they can create conferences and chat and do other things like that that you probably don't want. Now, down here where I've got this disable comments on announcements, if I were you, I would check that quicker than I would check anything else. As an instructor, you're probably going to use the announcements on a daily basis. You've got your announcements set to ASAP notification. Or even if you just got it set to daily notification, you're going to be getting a bunch of these notifications because the students will say, well, Ms. Pierce, thanks for telling us this, or Ms. Pierce, I'm not going to be there today. Okay? You're going to get all, you're going to get bombarded with emails or text messages. Don't let them comment on announcements. Just, just it's simple. Also make it where only teachers can create, rename, or edit course wiki pages. Because it would be really fun for a student to go in there and change the name of something and you don't know it and you keep recreating that thing or they can change anything they want. So always disable the comments and make it where only teachers can create, rename, or edit the courses. Okay? Any questions on that? Apparently not. Now, the part we were all talking about, sections. Sections allow you to put students in different class periods. Okay? So if you want your people to go into first period, second period, you would simply go in and you would say add a section called uh, period one. Or maybe you want to say uh, Miss let's see, P-E-A-R-C-E, not P-I-E-R-C-E. So y'all confuse me doing that. Miss Pierce's period one. Okay, I'm going to copy that because then I'm going to change that. And I'll add my section. When I want to go to the second period, I simply do add section. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Yes, sir. Now, once I, once I get these all done, we're going to do this for our block classes as well. We simply go into period one. There's nobody here. So I go to my edit section. And here's another thing that you want to write down. The start and the end date for that particular section. The start and end date of the section overrides the start and end date of the course, which overrides and overrides the uh, start and end date for the terms. Okay? So as a teacher, if you're going to have first, you're going to have your six class periods, you may want to start them on September 1st and end them on May 30th or May 29th. Users can only participate during that period. So then, when you've got your course set for everybody can get in from the uh, July 15th until whenever, as a teacher, you can still get in, but your students can't access it. Once you've got your students done like this, you've got your period set up with your start date and end date, all you have to do is then go back into your people, take your SIS IDs that you've got, add people 
you can paste all their numbers right here, put them in as a student, and then put them into Miss Pier Miss Pierce's period one. So, Craig, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Is this a Verizon okay. commercial? <laughs> so, what you're saying is we can do that with their um like MSIS numbers, and we don't have to uh, send that email to y'all to enroll them if they've already been enrolled once before? If, and that is a very good question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat the question because we're recording this if anybody else is listening and they can't hear you that well. The question okay. is, if you already have an MSIS number and your student is already enrolled in the Canvas system, can you just do this? Can you just pop this information in? and add students to your class yourself? The answer is yes. But they must be in the system, number one, and you must have your new course shell, number two. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Now you can also delete your students or remove a student from the class the same way. You simply go in and you say uh, remove from course, and that student is removed from the course. They are not deleted. They are removed from the course. All their content is still with that. With Canvas, we don't actually delete material. Canvas simply flags a course or a user or an enrollment as active, concluded, or deleted. If a course is deleted, if you have the course SIS ID, which I'll go back and show you in just a minute, and you give that to us, it will take us a couple of days, but we can go back in and reconstruct that course because the content is not physically deleted. It's just flagged as no longer there. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Who's that calling me, sir? Mr. Buckhoff, hey, would you tell him I'm not a sir? <laughs> I'm like y'all. I work for a living. Okay, sometimes. okay. On a day like today, I'm eating donuts, so I'm more like a cop. But that's how you can go in and create your sections. Okay, so there's my section one. So if I want to come in here, to Gerald, let's, let's see if I can get that to uh, edit section. I can go here and do the same thing. I can put them in one at a time like this. I probably don't have permission for that. That's right. Okay, that, that's right because the, the course is closed until September 1st. Okay, what's the question? Oh, uh, he was. We just had somebody that was asking, "Were you recording this?" And so he can go back and watch it later. Yes. But yes. You, you are right. I am recording this, and you will have access to this and the PowerPoint presentation, and any other material that we that we look at here today. I can share that with you as well. Okay, Most of this great. stuff right here that we're looking at, this is you can listen to the presentation. You can pause the presentation and then go into your own course shell and look at this. Okay, okay? great. So now we understand a little bit about the, um, the sections. If you're going to do a block schedule, you probably just want to put uh, – and again, make these course section names as, as descriptive as possible. Uh, fall 14, ICT 1, block. Okay, Craig, um, we have a question. If they have never used their Canvas account, are they, can they just go and log in, or do they have to contact you all to get a shell, or how does that work if they've never been in Canvas, period? Okay. The question is, if they've never been in Canvas, period, or if they signed up for a Canvas account last year and never used it, what do they need to do? The answer for both of them is you come to mde.instructure.com. And folks, always put it in the address bar. Do not put it in the Google search bar. If somebody gives you a specific address, you need to go to the toolbar, to the address bar, and put it in there. Otherwise, if you put it in Google, it's going to pull up a cached version. And if anything has changed since they, they got that cached version, you're going to have problems. 
Always put it here. Always have your students put it here. Okay? Now, for the five people who have either never used it or have an account but never used it, what we do is we go to this address right here, and that is mde.instructure.com slash courses slash 276. This is, we have revamped it from last year. Gives you an overview of Canvas. How do you create your course? But where do I begin is the second thing you want to look at. You want to request a course shell and student enrollment information. You will do this every single year. You will get a blank course shell every single year. Okay, so even if that, we used it last year, we have to do that again, huh? You have to request a new shell. The reason for that is you've got students in from last year. You've got content in from last year. Now, what do you think, and I'm going I'm to channel Richard Dawson right here, what do you think the number one answer is for why don't we leave up or why do we need to leave up the course shell from last year. So you got all your stuff and all your kids' assignments in there and grades and everything? That's right. So we can go back if somebody if somebody appeals a grade, we've got that. That's the number one answer. What do you think the number one wrong answer is? So we can go back and have stuff in case they appeal it. Because you know what's going to happen? If you're a good teacher, and all y'all are great teachers, you're going to go back and you're going to modify your course content from one year to the next. Not overhaul it, but just change some things. Yeah. Guess what? If somebody appeals it, the course you've got this year, that was last year's shell that you've changed, is no longer the course from last year. You no longer have content there to back up why you did something. Right. Okay? So what you do is you will simply at the end of each year, and hopefully you'll do this more often, I recommend doing it every time you update content, but you will go in and you will export your content and your quizzes from that particular course. So then you've got your archival copy. This year when you go in and submit that form again, you can go in and import the archive from last year but you can pick and choose what you want to bring in. So if you don't want to bring in two or three items, you don't have to worry about getting it up and then taking it out. Then at the end of this year, you take that course, you export it, and next year you get a new blank shell, and you go back in, and again, you pick and choose and modify what you want. So after three years, you've got three course shells that are no longer active. But if anybody wants to question it, you can go back and show them what you did in each year and how you have improved your course. That's one reason that you're getting a new blank shell each year. The second reason is, logistically, it is a nightmare to keep all of these accounts open. Because as you can see right now, in my courses, I've got 10 courses right here. I've already killed off about 15 of them. But if you start having, if you're teaching a couple of courses, not, not class periods, but courses, if you're teaching ICT-1 and ICT-2, and maybe you're taking two or three courses from the RCU, you're going to have four or five courses every year, and it's just going to start stacking up and getting longer and longer and more confusing to see what you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, we have a question that says, can you import all of last year's content at one time? Yes, you can. We'll get back to that in just a second. We'll get to that in just a second, okay? Okay. This is this is we're still on that uh, group of five who want to know what to do. Right. What right, you do right. is you come to this. You come to course two seventy six. You go to. Let me come back to it again. When you come to courses dash slash two seventy six, so where do I begin? Re request course shell and student enrollment information. When you go to that. New teachers, old teachers, teachers we don't even know about yet, read the page. Okay? District code, school code. 
Your course code name is in your curriculum. Your teacher license number, you need that too. Then what you're going to do, read the instructions for completing the sheet, download the sheet, fill it in, and then email it to us at helpdesk at rcu.msstate.edu. Okay? When we go to the spreadsheet, is very straightforward. You do have to put all the information in on every line. You've got to put your school name and number, your district name and number, your course name and number. As a teacher, you've got to put your, your first name, last name, teacher license number, and email address. <coughs> that has to go on every line where you've got a student. Okay? The student information, you've got to know their MSYS number. It does have to be nine digits. So if you've got a, a student with a six-digit MSYS number, you've got to put three leading zeros in that column. If they don't have an email address, don't put one in. Don't fake one. I cannot tell you the number of times we've gotten angry emails from somebody in Google or from Gmail that says, hey, why are you using my email address and why am I getting all these, these requests for verification from Canvas? So, you know, it might be cute to think about that, but hey, somebody really does have that, and I'm sure that somebody has the email address one at two dot com. If they could ever track me down, I'd be in big trouble because I use that all the time. I don't want to give my real one. So as a as a teacher, if you have never have never had a course, just go to this account and look at it. One thing, if you have not taken cool of the five of the three people who have never used Canvas at all, the two people, are you cool certified? One yes, one no. The one that's yes can get the course shell and get after it. The one who said no is going to have to go to my PLC and enroll in one of the uh, cool classes. I'll have to verify that. Let me get back with Mr. Buckholz and let him know. Uh, I don't know if he has to take the full-blown cool or cool for LMS or which one. We've got several different ones. Okay, so they're probably they're going to have to get certified. That's why, if they even if they've went through all these steps, that their canvas is not working, right? Uh, if it's a new user, as soon as they are enrolled, they get a temporary number, and they can go ahead and get the course shell. If they are already okay. cool certified, all they have to do is send in this form with their teacher number, and they're good right. to go. Okay. Okay. If you already used it last year, all you have to do, we're using the exact same spreadsheet. You can even use that if you had the one from last year. Just fill out that information correctly. And please, I beg you, I'm down on my knees. Okay. And, and the, the sand here in this place is like 500 degrees. Please verify that the student is, you've got the correct name for the student. You've got their correct MSYS number because what happens is we go through and we verify, especially if they're already in the course, if they if this is the same information from last year, and if it doesn't, if you put if you put a 12-digit code in for the MSYS number, it's going to kick it out. If you put a three-digit code in, it's going to kick it out. If you put the names backwards, instead of having Candy Pierce, if you put Pierce Candy. That is going to mess up how we assign the password. A user password for students is automatically generated. It is their last name and the four digits for their school code. It gathers that information from the spreadsheet that you do. So if you've got, instead of having Candy Pierce, instead of her user, her password being Pierce, one, two, three, four, it's going to be candy, one, two, three, four. So make sure you've got that correctly. Make sure you've got the MSYS number because once an MSYS number has been used in this state, even if it was the wrong number, unless we go back and find that number in the user data, that number cannot be used again. Because if we see that number and you give us the right number and we make it as active, Instead of being uh, Annie McGee, 
it may actually be uh, Louise Backstorm had that. So Louise's account is going to be active, not Annie McGee. We had that last year where we had people were, were giving the wrong numbers and it was assigned to somebody else and we delete one and as soon as we reactivate that number because it does not actually physically delete that record, it just reactivated that record. That took us a while to figure that out, but we finally figured it out. Okay? So that's what you do. Please make sure, and you'll notice over here, we've got our MDE Canvas blog. If you click on that, that is going to take you to our blog where we put information up about Canvas. Okay? Canvas reminders, requests are now available, all sorts of information. If you cannot access this, please get Mr. Buckholz to talk to your IT people and see if they can put this in because we've got all sorts of information about login. We're going to have training opportunities. One of the things we had a lot of questions about last year was how do we keep students from talking to each other? We created a role called Silent Student. And if I pop that in, it automatically searches through this, this blog. And it's just slow today it would actually come up with information about the silent student. Okay, So that's why you want to be able, you want to keep, always look at this right here. Also, Canvas guides. Canvas updates their system every three weeks. Okay, Everybody is aware of that, correct? Yes. With previous systems, they'd up, update every six months or so, or maybe once a year. Canvas goes in and works on things and updates their system every three weeks. Now, they work on it for four or five months before they update it. When they update it, they update their help files. We link you directly to the instructor guide so you can get the latest updates. If there is something that has been customized specifically for MDE's Canvas, we'll do help files for that. But most of the stuff can be found right here in the Canvas stuff, and it's up to date. Okay? Does that make sense? Does everybody get that? Yes, sir. Any questions? No, nope, we're good. Okay. So now we know how to go in and get to request the information to get the course shell. What was the previous question that you had that we said we'd come back to? Um, if all the content that was exported last year, can okay. it all be imported at one time? Question is, when you export your course from last year, how can you import it? First of all, I'm going to do this just to bring this back up. When we talk about the course enrollments, what you can do is come to this one right here, Canvas Course Requests and Student Enrollments. If you look at item number seven, we tell you exactly what to do right here. If you go to item number seven, you will see it says, before you go tripping out, remember you are able to export your entire, your entire course and bring it back in. For information on how to export, you click here. How to import, you click here. And what this will do is when you click on this, it brings you to the Canvas guide that has the instructions on how to actually go in and export your, your cartridge and import your cartridge. Okay? I want to give you that first so that you will know where to find that. Okay? Now let's go in and take a look at how you actually go in and import and export. First of all, we're going to go to the settings in the course navigation menu. So which button are we going to push? This is like Vegas. This is the audience participation part. Okay, we're going to go to settings in the course navigation menu. When we do that, you're going to see right here course details, navigation, apps, and so forth. And way over here on the right-hand side, you see where you've got your export your course content. Click on export. Always choose course. This takes your course content and your quiz. You click on create export. What it's going to do is it's going to go in and package this 
as an IMSCC file, formatted package. As you can see, I've already created some. You can do this however often you would like. I recommend doing it once you get your class into the new shell. Anytime you add content, back it up and download it so you've got the latest version of it. In case you make a mistake, then you can bring stuff back in. Once you've got it exported, you just click here to download, and it's going to download it as an IMSCC file. Can you see that right here? It's got the name of the course and IMSCC. So we would save this file. Doesn't take very long. Now, how do I get this into my new shell? You come to your new shell, and again, we're going to go to Settings. And on the right-hand side, you see Import Content into this course. Now, I'm going to actually change to a different one. But it's the same thing. I've got nothing in here, so I go to Settings. I go to Import Course Content. I know I clicked import. It says import content. You select the content type and you want to get the Canvas course export package. That's going to be your IMSCC file. So you click that, you browse to it, and then you go to your downloads or wherever you download stuff. And here's the course I just did. It's an IMSCC file and I say open. Now, Here's, the, here's what I really, really, really recommend that you do. Select specific content. Don't do it all. Say select specific content. Do not adjust your dates. If you do all, it's going to bring in everything. And if you realize you had something that you didn't want in there, now you've got to go and start taking things out. But by going in and selecting specific content, we click import. And what it's going to do is it's going to upload that IMSCC file from your computer. As you can see, it's running right now. Once it gets done importing this up to your particular account, it says select content. When you click on that, now you can choose. If you want everything, just go through and hit that box right there and everything will be uploaded. If you don't want everything uploaded, if you don't want certain assignments, you go in and say, eh, the introduction, I don't want that. I don't want that one. I do want module one, so I'm going to go get that one. And you can pick and choose what you want. So instead of getting all sorts, there's 86 wiki pages here. Do I really want all 86 of those wiki pages? Especially, of them, especially if some of them were just stuff that I started and then stopped and changed to something else. Roll me. I don't want to bring that up. I don't even know what that is. So I go through and pick and choose what I want. Here's the good thing about this. By doing select content, if you just want to get the stuff that's all module one, you can go through and pick just the module one wiki pages, discussion questions, and that, and move that up into your course content just to get it started. You can import content from this package at any time that you wish. It doesn't have to be all done at once. Okay? What Do you see that the... the not, I'm sorry, Craig. What if you did not export your class at the end of the school year back in May? Is it still Shame possible to export it? <laughs> Shame on you. I'm going home, okay? It's 10, 15. My donuts have gotten cold. My coffee has gotten hot. I'm sorry, my, whatever. Not a problem. We, we anticipated that, that a lot of people were not going to get the email first year of a new system is always difficult. We have left the courses open through December the 15th of this year. So all you have to do is log into Canvas, go to that course, go to Settings in the Course Navigation menu, and then go to Export Course Package. Okay, and you can great. download it. So you haven't lost anything. Again, the reason I recommend doing this every time you update the course content is you've got a clean, this is what you want. Okay? So if you, especially if you go in and delete something and you realize, oh, I didn't mean to do that, you can go back 
and bring it in from a previous course export. Okay? And especially if you wind up using Google Drive and Google Docs to, to put your some of your content on, you really enjoy this because then this thing takes like three seconds to download and three seconds to upload. And you can work on stuff during the course of the year even if the course isn't open. Okay? That's a good question. But now you see, once you once you get all this stuff, all you do is you say select content. And so if the only thing I want to bring up is a, is a syllabus body, okay, so I have nothing chosen, nothing here is chosen except the syllabus body. I'm going to choose Roll Me Too. I'm anxious to see what that is. So I click on my syllabus body and that, and I select, and now it's just going to upload those two items from that package. See how quickly that was done. I got one issue, and the issue is a missing link was found in the wiki page body. So now if I wanted to go over and look at my pages, I could find Roll Me and see what that is. And I really am anxious to see because I don't know. Roll me. You see, updated August the 4th. Okay, this was just an uh, example of how you can do a table of contents. And then you've got your syllabus. So that's all that you have to do to import your content from your previous course. Okay? Okay. Everybody good with that? Yes, we're good. How about you new guys, the, the five that, that never used it or haven't gotten it? Yeah, we have another question. Okay. Um, first of all, you're doing STEM this year completely new. Everything's new and different. I have nothing to import from anywhere. So I have a question. I've used Blackboard a whole lot for about five years, okay? In Blackboard, when I had a course, they had... Somebody had already from IT or whatever designed a shell with every with stuff in it, okay? And then you could go in that shell and then you could change it to however you wanted it. From what I understand what we're doing, Canvas didn't have a shell. Canvas is just the shell itself actually from my position, okay? And I go in and I create everything I want in my course, right? Okay, let's take this one step at a time. <laughs> No, I, no, I want to. Make, I want to make sure that we get this. We get this square away, so you understand where we're coming from. The okay, learning management I... system. Any learning management system is just a learning management system. It does not right. come with any content. It just comes with the shell. Gotcha. Okay. Do I have? Now, all right. So. It... Now, in the previous system, we had built up course cartridges that you could go in and bring in and pick and choose what you want to bring into that course. Okay. That was created, I believe it was a, a cooperative effort with people at the RCU and MDE and teachers in the field. We are currently working on trying to create those cartridges right now. Gotcha. So okay. that you can come in and bring items in. Now, remember what we just talked about. And who am I speaking to, by the way, with that question? Oh, this is Lisa. I'm sorry. This is Lisa Tillman. Lisa Tillman. Okay. I'm just trying to make notes here. I'm not. I'm not taking taking names and going to turn it into the professor because the center director sitting right there. He knows who asks these silly questions. Okay, Lisa. One of the things that we talked about a minute ago was if you go in and you export your course shell right here. It's going to create that IMS CC file. Okay. How do you export a shell if you don't have one to begin with? Okay. That's I'm question. just saying once you once you have content in there, you can export. Okay, See, okay. I've got content in there. I got that part. I'm talking about okay. getting content okay. in there. Follow, follow what I'm saying. You export. You've got your stuff that you've been building, no. and you export that. But it was in Blackboard. Pardon me? No, what you doing? No, we don't have anything. I have zero. I know that. I know that. Follow me. Follow what I'm saying now. Just, just wipe that brain clean. Let's just forget about the previous learning management system. Let's just follow this step by step. You start creating content for Lisa. 
right? Okay. With, with you go in. You go in based off the curriculum that you have, and okay. you start breaking out in the modules how you okay. want to teach things. Okay. Right. Welcome module one, module two, and then what content that you want to put in. Right. Okay. Now, does anybody else down there teach STEM? No. Let's say I'm that in. Candy Pierce does. Let's say Candy Pierce does. And Candy is creating her own STEM course. Okay. But she wants to share some of the stuff from yours, and you want to share some of the stuff from hers. Now, because of FERPA, we can't just put you in with full teaching privileges in her course. Gotcha. And even if we did, you would still have to copy and paste or take the content somehow from her course and bring it into yours. So right. what we do is if you start creating content, you export the content that you share that you have. If I have content already, I can share my shell with you and you can import content from that shell that I share with you into yours. Okay. And hopefully soon we will have one solid complete course that we then export as a shell. So that next year, when we start this process again in July, you can just go to the PACE site and download that course shell, that, that right. IMSCC package, and import what pieces of it that you want into your course. What we're going to have to find is somebody that's taught it. Contact them. Yeah. Get hey, Craig, this yeah. is Candy. Yes. Yes. Um, does STEM have a PACE site? You know what I'm talking about, like the business management, the, the marketing, that we have a PACE site. Does STEM have a PACE site, do you know? Yes, they do. Okay. Well, that's what she, I, I think that's what she's referring that? to. Uh, no, sir. Well, she's a brand new teacher to our district this year, so um, I don't think that she okay. does. But we need to get her enrolled, and she needs to have access to that pay site, and then I'm she can pull in. stuff. I'm, hey, no, wait a minute. Candy's half right. I took, a, I took the methods course this summer, so yes, I'm in pay, and that's what I was going to ask you. That was my next question. There's a lot of stuff in pay. Do I just import that? from there into my stuff? What I would need to do, I've, I've not been in the pay sites, okay? I'm a bad boy, I'm sorry. I've not looked at these things. Let me look at it and see what they've got. I don't know if they've got um, files that you can just download and then bring up into your course. I don't know if they've got course shells. And unfortunately, in my role as a teacher here, I can't see it. Okay, okay. okay. Unless well, I was yeah, enrolled I, in it. The other question uh, uh, I have is this. When I Is this Lisa still? Head, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I have one one thing that would help a lot. To just was kind of confusing to begin with. When I was in the methods class this summer, okay, yes. they have two they have two courses on under my name. One says. Wait a minute. That's your stamp. Okay, hang on one second. Let me just pull this up this way. Yeah, I, I saw that, but I'm asking him how to get it in my stuff. Yeah. That's what he's wanting. Okay, hang on one second. He said he didn't know. Uh -uh, no. Okay, look, one says method of STEM application import and then my name. Okay. And one says method of STEM applications and just my name. I just want to make sure that when I put everything in, I put it in the right one. Do I use the You don't use either of those. Okay, well, what do I use then, dear? You have to to request a course shell for your your STEM course. That's These what I've been are, trying to ask. Thank you. That's what I, that's everything I wanted to know. Thank you. Because see, okay. both of these had me confused, and I kept trying to figure out right. where the shell was. What what this is, you'll notice again, and and again, you're you're looking at my administrative my system administrator. You are a teacher in the methods of STEM application import. You were taught how to import something in. Right. This is the methods of STEM where you were supposed to do it as a teacher and create content. Okay. This one is the methods of STEM that you were enrolled in as a student. And that is, as you can see, you've got all those different things in there. If you had another one called methods of STEM for this year, you wouldn't know which method to look at, which is why we're trying to close things out. 
Now you are in the pay site, so while we're here, let's just go in and take a look at this. Yeah, I've got paid. That's, yeah, and, okay, and I'm just looking to see what they've got as far as files and everything. Um, well, why don't we just finish this later? I was just asking a girl. I wanted to ask a quick question, and it's not quick. So. Okay, what they've got here, Lisa, in the STEM, they've only got four units here. Right. And so what, what these are, are there videos and different things? And yeah. so that's kind of a problem. I haven't looked at it. I'm sorry, I haven't looked at it either because we didn't that's get okay. the information. All they've got, they've got, looks like they've got some videos and different things. Yes, sir. And again, well, we can talk about that on, on, on at, a, at another other section. But all, yeah, they don't have a whole lot of anything other than video. But what you would have to do here is say on section eight. You're going to have to go in and download all the files in this folder as a zip. When you do that, you're going to see it go through and begin compressing these, these items. Now, once you've got it, you click to download it, and it downloads okay. it. Then what yes. you would have to do okay. is once you get that all the information right here, you would have to go back to your course. And let's just say this um, import file for right now. You would go into your file section, and you would take all of these items, yes, sir. drag them, and drop them. And well, that's because of, I know why that is. I have to unzip that's that first. Go ahead. But you would simply add your files right here and would yes. upload them. Thank you. OK, Thank so you're going to have to download and upload. And even if you were in as a teacher in another STEM teacher's class, this is the process that you would have to follow. This okay. is why I really like to recommend that you guys put content up in a Google Drive account, in a Google Docs account, where you can just okay. share out and people can just go in and link to the content in your course rather than having to download it. But that's another thing for another day. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? No. Okay. Never push this button. <laughs> okay. You have permanently delete this course, and it's going to make me a very unhappy person. Okay. The course statistics. You know, you can go in and look at all of your information what you've got as far as assignments, who's doing what, student information, you can see what they've done, and file storage. Okay. Now, one thing I did want to, I wanted to tell you about. In the event, well, I won't say in the event. First thing you need to do is when you go into your new Canvas shell, is go to the course details, come down here to the the term date and everything, and you should have an SIS ID. Let me find one that I created now. I can show you that because I don't have it there. Your SIS ID is very, very important in order for us to be able to come back and reconstruct your course. You see right here? If you will go in and copy your SIS ID and put that on a piece of paper somewhere, if you will just sit here and copy all this information right here and paste that into a document, then if we ever say, if you say, oops, you know, I know you told me not to, but I pushed that delete this course button. And can you fix it for me? If I have this number right here, I can. If I don't, I probably can, but it's going to take a lot longer to do it. Okay? So when you go in, get this information. Also, it will help us if you're having problems with something. When you fill out a help ticket through the help desk, if you can put this number in, we now know what we're looking for. Because again, if you look at mine, you see I've got two different online learning. I'm teaching both of them. See, there's my Google. That's as a teacher in the spring. This was in the summer. 
But if you just say Google and you've got two or three courses over the past year, I'm not sure which one I'm going into. But if you give me that ID number, I can simply go in and look for that. Okay? Any questions on that? Hey, look, we're back at the PowerPoint. Go ahead. Go ahead. Back at the PowerPoint, the draft state. Now, we've pretty much already forgotten the rest of the PowerPoint because we already jumped to it. Draft state is a new feature that they've added. And, Candy, you notice that little green cloud icon that said published. Yes. Draft state now allows you to publish or unpublish modules or content items. Previously, you had to publish your course in order for your students to see it. Right. Once it was published, it was, it was out there for God and everybody to see. If you didn't want your students to see something, you had to go to the page, and you had to hide the page. Well, when you did that, it hit it in the module, and you tripped out saying, oh, no, I didn't do this, it's deleted this. I got a lot of those in January. So. This works now where you can publish and unpublish content and modules. There are a couple of caveats, and we'll go over that in just a minute. It allows you to make it visible or invisible as needed or desired. And it does work well with date lock, course requirements, and course prerequisites. Have any of the um, three users used the, the date, the course requirements, or the prerequisites? Well, I take that to no. I don't know. I'm going to say Do I? no. I'm Everybody say says no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you first get your course shell, you have to publish it for it to be accessible by the users. And you'll have a thing across the bottom of the screen that says the course is not published. Do you want to publish now? Once you do that, it's active. Now, you see this course is published right here. And this is where terminology is, again, important. If I ask you if your course is published, if you go to it and it's got this gray box across the bottom, no, it's not published. If I go up here and it's gray, that's a different way of publishing. That's going to be in this new draft state, which they call the new norm. Inside your modules, you will notice everything is green. Oh, wait, here's one that's gray. Green means that it is published, and students can now view that content. Okay? If it is gray, the student cannot view that content. Now, Candy, who are the other two that used this last year? Candy and who else? Um, Mary McLaughlin and uh, Yancey Ross. Okay. Mary oh, and it's, Yancey. Uh, Stacy Pierce. Stacy, so I had four that used it last year. Somebody can't count. Somebody doesn't get an apple today. Okay. Oh, Mr. Ross didn't use it with his classes. He just used it himself. Okay, okay. Well, then somebody gets half an apple. We'll okay. give you the half that's already been nibbled on, okay? Now, remember last year, if you went to a wiki page, what happened? What was right over oh, no. here? What was right over here? I don't know. I didn't use Wiki. Uh, if you, you you didn't do any content pages? I didn't do a Wiki page. If you put a content, you did. If you did an announcement, oh. you did. Anyway, okay. anyway, that's cool. That's cool. On the right-hand side over here, anytime you went to a Wiki page, all of your other pages showed up over here. So if anybody wanted to, they could just go and see, look at all pages, and they could see all of your pages. You can't do that now in the draft state. They finally fixed that. Okay? So if I want to hide a page, all I have to do is go up here and say unpublish. And now I can see this as an instructor, but if I go into and look at it as a student, I'm not going to be able to see that. I can't see that in this course anyway because I've got it hidden. But now as a student, I'm not going to see anything over here. And if I had modules pulled up here, I couldn't see the modules because it's unpublished. The student can't see it. How do you handle this? 
as an instructor, you simply do view all pages. You find the page that you want to edit. And in this instance, it was overview. And so here it is. You'll notice everything else is green. This is gray. To make it accessible, I simply come over, left click, and publish it. If it's got a green cloud with a check mark, that means anybody can see it. Okay? Now that's really cool because that way you can be working on something and nobody can see it except you. Same thing in the modules. If you go in and unpublish something, I can go in. Now here's the, here's the two caveats. Let's see if I can find a really short one to do. Table of contents. I'll do page holds. Page holds, you see, says it's, it's not published. Therefore, most people you think would not be able to see it. However, you have all of these that were published that you have to manually unpublish one at a time to get them out of there. Okay. Now, if I'm ready to publish this entire module, I click on publish the module and it automatically publishes everything inside of it. Again, to unpublish it though, I have to go and do each one by itself to unpublish. Okay? So if you've got content and you're not seeing it, and I say, well, you probably haven't published it. And the first thing that Candy's going to say is, well, yes, I have. I published it. That's why I can see it. My students can see that. I just can't get, you know, I can't see it. And that's what I'm going to say, Candy. Have you published the content? Yes, I have. No. Go to the modules. Is it gray or is it green? Okay? So if you publish it, you've got to go in. It publishes automatically. Unpublishing it, it's one at a time. Okay? Now, in addition, in addition to that one, the other caveat is, well, if I can unpublish these things, I've always wanted to start each nine weeks with a clean grade book. I can just unpublish these things, and I'll start with a clean grade book. Because if it's unpublished, it doesn't show up in the grade book. Nice try. Pat yourself on the back. Wrong answer. What happens is, right here, you can see one of my assignments. And I want to unpublish it. And it says, can't unpublish if there are student submissions. So your first nine weeks, first time somebody puts something in it, you can no longer unpublish it. Okay? That's still not a problem. We can still fix it where you can start with a clean grade book, and that's something I'm going to put in the blog today. Do you all understand publishing, unpublishing inside the course it's itself? Yeah. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah. Okay. Question for y'all. Uh, do you guys use Google Apps for Education? No. Are you familiar with what Google Apps for F Education is? I know some Okay. Of Pardon? We know a little bit. Okay. You know the name. That's good. That's a start. That's all I started with. Okay. Google Apps for Education includes several of their apps. The most, the most greatest one of them all is Google Drive. Google Drive, just as a common citizen of the world, you sign up with your Gmail account, you get 15 gigs of storage. Okay? That right there is worth the price of admission alone. 15 gigs. It also has... the ability to go in and create Word documents, spreadsheets, and PowerPoint presentations. The presentation we're looking at today is all done inside of Google. Okay? You can actually come in, if you look at this course that we're looking at right here, most everything is linked out. Why is that? 
Well, it's in the cloud. <laughs> Y'all knew that. Y'all were just making me say this. No donuts for you today. Now, everything you link to in Canvas is in the cloud. But Canvas does have some limitations. If you've ever worked inside of Canvas, you will notice that when you go in to create a page, I'm going to go to View All Pages, and I'm going to create a page. Now, this is based somewhere in the cloud. I don't know where, but it's in the cloud somewhere. So I give it right there. Now, if I want to start adding content, I just start adding content. If I want to take stuff from a Word document, I simply copy that, and I can paste that, and it puts it in. But you'll notice it's lost all of its formatting and all of its styles. Okay. Plus, I have some limitations on my formatting here. And oops, if I didn't want to put this in, there's no undo button, right? But this is saved in the cloud. Now, let's say that I was using my Google Docs, and I want to create a new document, and I'm going to call it Perry County Test. I know that's real original, but that's me. Now, I take the stuff that I just copied from Word, and I paste it in, and it kept all of my formatting, and it's trying to bring that image in. Okay? So now that I've got this, and if I want to format this, oh, I really didn't want to do that. I've got my, my buttons right here. Here's the fun part. I go to File, and I share this. And I share this with anybody who has access, anybody with the link can view this. And then I copy this link. Okay? Now, Lisa, this is another way you can share content between STEM teachers. Candy, you can do this as well. Now if I go back to my Perry County, and if I view this all, Oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to go to this one at all. I go to my modules. And on this very first one, Welcome to Canvas, I'm going to add an external URL. And I'm going to paste that Google Docs in and say, and I add the item. Now, if you'll notice, it's got a link to things just like these other things. So now, when I click on this, there it is. There's the document that I just created in Google. Now, I know Yancey is saying, hey, that's cool, but you know what? That, why do I want to do that? That's a very good question, Yancey, and I'm glad you asked that one. If I go to my modules, I actually need to go to pages. If I go to pages, And I want to find that page that I just created. There's my Perry County test. So when I go to this, I'd really like my students to be able to, to access this and, and download it and, and make a copy of it. How do you do that? Anybody? I can't short of going up here and printing out the entire page or copying and pasting into another document and doing it that way. Okay? However, in Google, if I go in and view this as a student, they can actually come over here, go to File, and download it as a Word document or a PDF file. Okay? So now they've got a way. They can't do anything else. They can't format it. They can't edit it. They can't do anything. But if you wanted to put up a form for them to download, to take home, to get signed, to go on a field trip, all they've got to do is download as a PDF document. And Viola, there it is. I'm going to open this. And there is a PDF document right there 
that all they've got to do is download and print out. Okay? How many of you do something as a Word document or as a PowerPoint, and then you make a PDF file so they can download it? Any of you? Me? I do. Me? Who's the, who said me? Uh, Candy. <laughs> okay. Candy, what happens then if you want to go in and change something on this? Uh-oh. Redo it and then re-download it. It's very frustrating. Uh-oh. There's a problem. So what I do <laughs> is I come in here. Because I'm logged into Google, I come into the page on Canvas, and I'm going to change this to sign up sheet. I'm going to make that bold. Now, the student sees that change instantaneously. And the student goes to file and download as PDF instantaneously. And guess what? The change is made, and you haven't had to do anything except change it in that Google Doc. OK? So you don't have to worry about doing something on your computer, uploading it, making sure you get rid of the old file, put the new one in, make sure it's linked properly. Now make the PDF, upload that, change that, get rid of the other one, move this around, it's a whole bunch of junk. This way, all you have to do is make one change in your Google Doc. Plus, it's in a folder right here. It's, it's, it's in a frame inside your Canvas. So you don't have to do anything. OK? That way, in your module section, instead of having a bunch of content pages, like they've got right here, which if I want to change this one, now I've got to go in and say, OK, edit this, and I want to change, I want to change this. And oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I took out too much. Who knows the shortcut to undo? Google Docs. Oops. It's in, 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 I think it's Control Z, isn't it? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. I've had to learn that because there's no button back here. OK? But all of these things, whether it is something that is inside of Canvas or something you're bringing from Google Docs, it's in the cloud somewhere. OK? With Google Docs, you just have the ability, let's do this. I'm going to copy all of this. I'm going to go into my Google Doc again. And this time, actually, I'm going to show you how you can do it in, from inside the, the, the course. So I'm going to go to Modules. And I decide I want to change this Google demo right here. OK? All I have to do is, as long as I am signed in right here, and this is in the edit mode, watch this. All gone, all paste. Whoop, that's not the right one. I guess I didn't. Copy. Now, there's all my Perry County stuff right here, right? Say I want to look up Canvas, and I actually want to just go in and find some research on this. I research it, and over here, it goes through Google and searches for Canvas. So if I want to do this learning management system, I can insert my link right there. Oh, wait a minute. Miss Pierce, Candy Pierce, or Stacy Pierce. We haven't called on you today, Stacy. Stacy, what do you really want your students to do? You want them to cite where they got information, right? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I just cited the information right there. As an instructor, now when you're finding stuff, you can cite stuff. Also, you can go in and filter what you're looking for, anything that's free to use, and you can use the APA style sheet. So if I come into uh, development, and I want to research that. It goes through and it finds whatever I want. So if I want to use this one, first of all, I know based on the, the criteria I put, it's free to use. I'm not going to go to jail over this. So now if I go development uh, from Wikipedia, I insert the link. And then I cite this APA style. And you see it automatically bumps the rest of the stuff down. 
as a student then, they can come in, they're looking at this stuff, And if I go back to my module, up, oh, I got my Google Doc right here, my Google demo. There it is, right now. There are my citations, and here's what the student does. Then, what is Canvas? You click on this, and I bet I've got it blocked here. Typically, you're going to click on this, and it's going to take you out to the link where you can go and see that information. I've got it blocked. I forgot. I apologize for that. There it is. So now you can add content to your content without having to go back and forth between things and look at things. Okay? Questions on that? I like using Google Docs. Because even if the class is closed, I can put this up here in my Google in my Google account. And if I want to share this with y'all as a teacher, all I've got to do is come in here and then share. And do any of y'all have a Google account? Again, this is the audience participation part of the show. Okay, if anyone has a, a, a uh, let's see, somebody give me their Gmail account, please. Hillman Not everybody at once. <laughs> Do what? Hillman331 at Gmail. It would be Lisa, T-I-L-G-H-A-M, 331. No, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Yep, M-A-N, sir. Man. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. 331? 331 at Gmail. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I'm just going to put this where she can view it or she can make comments on it. By putting her being able to make comments, she can go in. When I send this to her, if you've got your smartphone right now, Lisa, you should be getting an email from Google yes, saying that this, you just got it? Yes, sir. Got it. Click, click on it, please. I did. Yes, sir. It opened up that, that presentation, didn't it? It's in there with a the link to open it. Yes, sir. Click on it. Please quit calling me, sir. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I, that works for me. That's a language I understand. I do have it. Okay. So now you can see this. And if you needed to, you could make comments like, why did you call it the facts, just the facts? And then I could see what your question is. And because I have control over it, I can make changes based on your, your comments. You can also go in on your computer. And you're able to right click. When you go into this, if I go to share, I can copy this link right here. And then I can go back into my document right here. And if I want to change it from this one to the PowerPoint now, I go to modules. I edit my Google demo. I put my new stuff here, and I'm going to call it uh, that, and I update it, and guess what's going to happen now when I click this button? I am going to access the PowerPoint presentation right there. So now you can create PowerPoints and share with your other instructors without having to give them destructive power by putting them in your classroom, which we had last or a couple of years ago with the previous learning management system. So that's all you've got to do. They can they can they can present that then they can look at it just like you're watching it. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Or any questions? Any questions at this point? No, we're good. 
Okay, user interface, we've been through the dashboard. Do you have any questions about that? Nope. The global navigation menu. Any questions about that? Help corner. We're, we know about settings up there. Course navigation menu. That's always going to be on the left. Course settings. That's where you're going to manage your course. You're going to set your course dates or create sections. There is one thing we didn't cover. I need to cover this real quick because I know you've got to go. When we are looking at a course as a student, you'll notice I limit the buttons that they can see. I actually don't even allow them to see modules or quizzes. This was just done so you could see this on this, this introductory course. Most of the time, let me just let me do this. If I take somebody into my social media course and I go in as a student, I don't want them to have access to every button. I want to control what they see so I can control the pace of the course. I want to see announcements, discussions, their grades. People is questionable. Again, as a student, I don't know if you want your 7th and 8th grade students to be able to see every student in the course so they can send them information and things like that. They don't see any personal information. They do not see email addresses or cell phone numbers or Twitter accounts or anything like that. But as you can see, my students are limited to home, announcements, discussions, and grades. The reason is, when they come in, first of all, to Canvas, the dashboard is going to say whether or not they've got announcements and what their items are to do, if they've got any inbox messages. Once I get them in, how many of you would come in on your home page last year and change it every day to let your students know what they were supposed to do that day? Anybody? Not every day. But every time your activities changed, you changed your front page, didn't you? A lot of teachers did that. A lot of teachers across the state would come in and they'd say, uh, welcome to Miss McGee's STEM class. And then down here it would say, your stuff to do today is do this and do this and do this. And oh, by the way, happy Mardi Gras. Now. They change it every day. Guess what? I missed the first two days of the week because I was at Mardi Gras. I missed my assignments for that day, my activities for those two days, because you change this every time you change activities. By putting it in announcements, the student comes in and they see the announcements. So if I want to put something in here for somebody to do, I simply go in and say, Today is August the 4th. Click here to do this. And this is going to take me to a link inside that course. OK? If I were to go to the next item there, it would take me to then do this. It would take me to something inside that course. OK? That makes it easier for you as an instructor two ways. Number one, you don't have to keep changing your home page to change assignments or anything. Okay, If you want to change something for Labor Day, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas and put some kind of a graphic, you can do that. But you don't have to change it constantly. The second thing is announcements. How many of you used announcements regularly last year? I use a few, not regularly. <laughs> and and who was that? Candy? Yes. Okay. I, I don't know voices yet, okay? This isn't Star Trek. I'm not looking at the view screen. Okay. Candy, you used announcements. Yes. You've got a week's worth of assignments to do, and you're fixing to go out to some big conference somewhere, right? Sure. All you have to do, all you have to do, on your assignments is sit down on 
Friday afternoon after your last class has left or during a, during a work period or something, you make your announcements for the coming week. Oh, wait, Craig, no, we can't do that because we don't want them to see it. Well, you don't have to let them see it. Uh, let's see, August 7th. And spelling does not count here. Uh, here is what you do today. And I can come over here and I can say, Add a resource, uh, contact info, assignment, and a quiz. Okay? Now I've got everything here to do, and I don't want that to come up until the 7th. All I have to do is say delay posting and open that up on the 7th at 8 a.m. and save that. Now that announcement will go out on the 7th at 8 a.m. whether you're there or not. Your students will get their activities to do if they got a substitute teacher or if they got you. Okay? So you can sit there a week at a time and put your announcements up. All right? Now, the good thing about this is when you do your announcements, if I wasn't here on May 28th, but I've got this done where you've got to meet certain uh, prerequisites and requirements to get to the next next level, they have to go through these in order. So if I missed Monday, I go to Monday's class and see what to do, and I do my assignment. And then when I get done with that, I come back and I go to Tuesday's class, August the 4th, and begin doing things right here. You see how you can use announcements to pre-plan your week without having to do it every single night. Also, what you've got is some documentation. And I hate using that word because I like people to be adults and, and take responsibility. You've got the documentation. But Mr. Buckholz comes in and says, uh, Ms. Backstrom, you know, I, this student came to me and said their assignment wasn't there, and they didn't know what they were supposed to do that day. All you've got to do is say, well, here are my announcements that go back. And if you look at this, it shows you what they were supposed to do on a specific day. Right? Now, I know Mr. Buckhalter will say, well, now, Ms. Backstrom, how do I know that, that, that you didn't just change this when I called you? Well, that's very, very simple. I go to one that's already locked, but then if I go to the edit mode, it's going to show me if I've got any previous versions of that, which I don't. It's the same thing when you have pages. If you change pages, if you change the content on a page, it is going to go in and it's going to tell you when that stuff was changed. Let me see if I can find one where I've changed. I don't have any previous versions. I could let me do it on this one so I can show you on this one. Okay. On this course right here, if I went in to look at um, the overview. I've already changed those out, so let's see if I've got some pages here I haven't wiped out yet. You see this last edit? This shows you this was edited in February of 2014. This one was edited August of 2013 by system administrators. So if you go in and click on this, you can go back and show them Where is it? They've changed it on me. Uh-oh. They've changed it on me. See, I can make mistakes too, and I've had lots of practice at this, so it's not like you're getting something unique. If you go look at the last edit, there we go. That's the last thing that was done when it was last edited. Okay? So you can go back and you can find out when the edit was and who made that edit. So 
you've got that documentation right there that if you have any problems, because you're using announcements, you've always got that to come back to. Did you all ever think about that? Is anybody still with me? Or? You're here, but you're ready to go, aren't you? <laughs> okay, content types. We know all the different content types. Discussion types, assignments, quizzes, external URLs. Again, very good. Everything you're doing here is in the cloud somewhere. So if you can link it back to the original source by embedding it, it's going to be kept inside that particular tab. It's not going to have an address bar where your students can go anywhere else. Plus, by not downloading content that you don't own, you don't run the risk of going down the road to Greene County and spending time in that nice hotel they've got. The one that keeps you safe from everybody on the outside, you know, the ones with the, with the barbed wire fence and everything. Yeah, yeah. Course management, starting end dates, when students can access it, we've talked about. Uh, okay, that's what I'm, I'm going to do this. I started and I got carried away. On your students, on the settings, navigation, anything above this line, your students can access. Anything below this line, your students cannot access. It is not going to affect putting content in here as far as you're concerned, but it keeps students from accessing things. That's important because you really don't want them to have access to chat or conferences or collaborations, especially if they have permission to start their own, because they'll be having conversations at night that you don't want to hear about. And it's going to get somebody in trouble. So always on your navigation, again, to me, announcements, discussion, grades is about all I would put in there. If you want to put people so they can see all the other people in their class, that's fine. You don't have to do that. These course FAQs and the tech blogs and all, these are apps that I have put in that are basically redirecting from somewhere outside of Canvas. In the previous system, a lot of times people would just fill this thing up with buttons for everything they could think of. I saw one that said, have a Coke and a smile. I don't know how they were going to do that from online, but they put it up there. Now, what you can do here is you can link it to an external link somewhere by simply coming down to the icon down here that is the redirect arrow. When you do this and you add the tool to your course, and you have the ability to add this to your course, you go and get the file, the address that you're going to link to, which if we were going to do something with, with Google Drive, you'd put that here. You'd give it a name, and you would say, show it in the course navigation menu and show it in the user navigation. What happens is it puts a button over here so that my course FAQs, if I've got two or three different courses, rather than having to try to upload it into all of the different courses and make sure I've got all the changes made, I simply link that out to a Google document right here. Again, the students can print this out, do whatever they need to with it. I can also put a blog. If you are teaching ICT-1 or STEM and you want to link to something like um, any kind of a place where you can go in, Grovo, for instance, where you can go in and do some, some online learning, you can link to that from right here. Just put that link in and put it there. You cannot put a Canvas site in because what it will do is in the user window right here, it will open another Canvas site. So you'll have two course navigation menus side by side. And you'll start getting confused. It's just it puts a course inside the course. So only use this for external sources outside of Canvas. OK? Any questions on the settings now? And how to do your navigation and your apps and your sections. OK, so in summary, know your terminology. Navigation menu and navigation menu and stuff like that. Know the user interface. 
course navigation is always on the left. Global navigation is always on the top. Plan your course. Figure out how you're going to do it with modules and with content and where your content is going to come from. Build your course according to that plan and then manage that course effectively. Questions? Uh, I know you're, when you're tired we, of this. Go, go ahead. When we request our new course shell, is that going to be automatic or how long will that take? <laughs> the question is when you request a course shell, how long will that take? Please allow us 72, well, I won't say 72, three working days. Because if you send okay. me something at 5 o'clock Friday night, don't expect it at 8 o'clock Monday morning. Okay. But three working days, what happens is we get bogged down with people sending in, well, here's two students, or here's two more students, here's two more students, take this one out, put this one in, things that they could do themselves. And we have to, the process that we go through to make sure that we're not mixing up numbers and things can go, if, if we do it best case scenario, everything's perfect takes five minutes. So we can process 12 an hour. If you've got errors, it could go up to 30 minutes to an hour to process. And when that happens, we get backed up. Once you send in that request and you have your course shell, you can start building. If you have a student who drops out of your course or is transferred to another section, another teacher, you can remove them from your course yourself, okay? Remember that. You can go in right here to settings, or I'm sorry, people. You go to people, and if I want this person out of my class or they've transferred out, all I have to do is remove from course, okay? So that's something that you can do yourself to speed up the process instead of sending us a spreadsheet. If you have a student who is transferring from Ms. Tillman's class to Ms. McLaughlin's class, all Ms. McLaughlin has to do is have that MSYS number and add the person and put their MSYS number right here. And all Ms. Tillman has to do is go in and go right here and remove that user from the course. Because they're already in the system, you can transfer them back and forth between yourselves however you want. It's just if they, until they're in the system, you can't do that. Go ahead. Um, if the question was, what if they come from a different school? But if they have an NSYS, NSYS number in the system, it should still work, right? Correct. If they come from a different school in DeSoto okay. County, and they are already in the the Canvas system, you can transfer them in to whatever class you want. If somebody goes from Perry County to Starkville. As long as they were already in a course and in the Canvas system, all you have to do is put their MSYS number in. If they don't have an MSYS number, let's see, 15967863998463. And I want to add this as a student, guess what? User does not exist. Okay? Okay. Uh, Craig, I, the question we have is, Will their work follow them? But I don't think so because it's going to be submitted with a different teacher in a different course, right? Um, I do not think their work. No, their work will not follow because while the the, the work is tied to their user account, it is also tied to a specific course number and course SISID. So the work will not transfer with them. Now, what you could ask is get in contact with the previous teacher and ask them to go into the grades and, let's see, they can go into the speed grader and they can download, where is it? They can download the stuff for that individual person if they wanted to, and then you could automatically bring it back in and upload it. I will get that procedure and make that procedure available. 
that's a good question. I will need to ask Canvas, is there a way that we can do that easier? I know that if you go in to the grade book here, I can, um, where is it? Here it is. I don't have this. That's not an assignment. That was a download my submissions right here. And so if I download my submissions, what that's going to do is it's going to take all the submissions from all of the students. And that's going to be easier than, than necessarily going through each one of these one at a time. But where is that? I may be in the wrong area. I don't teach a lot, so I don't necessarily do some of these things. But it's a good question to ask, and I'm glad you asked me these things. Let's see. Twitter assignments. No, I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, or maybe they've changed it. But that's. You can actually just go in and download the entire entire thing and then pull his out of there if they need to. But that's a good question. Let me follow up on that, please. Okay. Other questions? I got anything else. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Um, Mr. Buckhalt, here's, here's the information that you really need to focus on when you send any Submissions, any any uh, enrollment requests, send it to help desk. Okay, write that number down. Keep it close to your to your desk. We are trying to funnel everything through the help desk, so that you don't send it to me, and Marilyn, and Michelle, and Leanne, and Teresa, and somebody else maybe that that's one of your that wrote your curriculum, and get six different emails coming in and have six different people trying to answer your question, it, it gets confusing. Or if there's something that needs to be worked on, don't have somebody get to it and start calling you up or researching it and saying, well, you know, Jack, I, I don't see a problem with this. And you say, well, you know, Craig, I, Marilyn helped me with this. You know, because now we're, we're, we're wasting time that we could be used helping Candy because we thought Jack's problem needed to be fixed. So keep that number and name, that, that address right there, and that phone number in mind. These Twitter accounts, and this is the MDE Canvas WordPress. Now, Mr. Buckholz had, sure. had suggested that possibly you may need some help and may would like some face-to-face -face come down and take you through how to create your content. Is that something that you would like to discuss at a later date? Yes. Yes, sir. Did, did this overview right here, did these two hours with the navigation, the terminology and all, did that help you at all? Yes. Do you have a better understanding now of what Canvas is? Yes. You know, I know y'all shaking your head. I just don't know if it's going up and down or side to side. Yes, yes. yes, yes. You know, I just so okay. So when would you? When would your next opportunity for professional learning that you would need? I'll just look at the calendar, Craig, and I'll you know get back to you. 